beg that, like me, most of you have never been to the moon, and we probably never shall. But the next best place to visit is an area called Cappadocia in Turkey, and that's where we're going next, for it's the land of the lost empire of the Hittites. fairy chimneys as they are called with their hats set at all sorts of rakish angles you just really wonder how the creator thought this one up wouldn't you of course you can tell me it's a natural phenomenon and it really is actually this was some soft stone that was laid all over this area and then on top of that came a a layer of lava, you know, a volcanic layer spread out all over here. And as the harder lava cracked and got worn away, then of course what was not covered by lava was also worn away. But where the lava still stood, then of course it was protected. And so here we have these fairy chimneys. During the Christian era, there was a lot of persecution, and so many Christians settled in this area, not, not that they escaped the persecution, but it attracted less attention, and so they were less harassed here. And they dug their houses out of the soft rock, out of these pinnacles. In fact, some people today still live in these houses that they dug or build their own houses attached to them. I would say this is one of the better class houses. It is dug out of the cliff face, soft rock, easily cut into. You can see the pick marks where they have chiseled it out. And there are recesses where they could store food and other domestic items needed in the house. And there are niches where they could place their lamps to illuminate the inside of the house at night time. I'd say they live rather comfortably here. The Christians also carved their churches and chapels out of this soft rock and adorned the walls of them with very colourful frescoes. Many of the Christians went a step further and burrowed into the ground. They dug into the cliff face and then made just like a rabbit warren. They lived right underground. They burrowed down through this soft rock, their passages and staircases and housing rooms. You, you know, they went down eight stories, eight stories down below the ground surface. And there were rooms and houses and places to live down here. <laughs> you were at least close to your neighbours. No doubt this was great for the children, but what about the adults? They must have had a permanently bent back to be able to walk along these passages and feel at home. I suppose they were used to it. Of course, they lived here during the night and evening. Daytime, they went out and looked after their fields. Of course, they had to have some fresh air, even away down here, so they dug this shaft from the surface right down 
to the lower story so that the fresh air could come down here and circulate through the passageways and into the rooms in which they were living. But I, I'm still not sure, sure that this is where I would really like to live. This then is Hittite country. They occupied all of Cappadocia and Anatolia, in other words, what we'd call most of Turkey. And they're a very great nation. In fact, at one stage in ancient history, they were the greatest nation in the Middle East. And yet the extraordinary part is they were lost, forgotten. Scholars even denied their existence. It's interesting to look at the Encyclopedia Britannica for the year 1861. And under the title Hittites, you know what? There's just eight and a half lines. And if you examine those eight and a half lines carefully, you'll find that it's purely and simply a summary of what the Bible says, just a brief summary of what the biblical record has to say about them. Well, actually, there's a lot in the Bible about the Hittites. As far as the Bible is concerned, they were never lost. 47 references in the Bible to the Hittites. It goes right back to the days of Abraham. In Genesis chapter 23, when his wife Sarah died, it says, then Abraham stood up from before his dead and spoke to the sons of Het, they're the Hittites, you see, saying, give me property for a burial place. And he purchased a place to bury his wife, Sarah. And many references in respect to the Israelites coming into the promised land. For instance, in Genesis 7, verse 1, it says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Gergesites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, there's seven nations there, and you'll notice the Hittites are at the top of the list. And yet, the Amorites, the Canaanites, were very familiar with them, and they were very well-known and strong nations. Yet, the Hittites are put at the top of the list. Now, there's another verse that should have caused the scholars to do a little deep thinking on, and that's in 2 Kings chapter 7 and in verse 6 where it says, uh, referring to the Syrians besieging Samaria, and all of a sudden the besieging army packed up and fled. And what was the reason? Well, it tells us here. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Now, everyone knew that the Egyptians were very strong and powerful. But here, it puts the Hittites ahead of the Egyptian army. Now, quite obviously, the Bible knew that they were a very powerful nation. And you've got these 47 references, and yet they were lost and forgotten for a long time. The story of their discovery is a very exciting one. It's one of these long, drawn-out dramas, and I want to tell you all about that. Our story really doesn't begin here in this village. It began in the city of Hamath in northern Syria in the year 1810, when John Burkhart, the man who discovered Petra later on, was visiting there, <coughs> and he found built into a house some stones that had some strange writing on it. And he wrote later in his book called Travels in Syria of these stones, he said they were hieroglyphs, but they weren't Egyptian hieroglyphs. But of course, he didn't know who was responsible for this strange writing and he simply recorded it. Now, the scholars should have picked it up, but I suppose there were so many other exciting things in his book, they just didn't notice this. So the next thing was in the year 1834, when Charles Texier was traveling through Turkey, and he was looking for a lost city, the lost city of Tavium, a Roman city. 
and he would go from village to village, town to town, and he would say, uh, are there any ruins here? And he'd go and look at them to try and identify them as Tavium, you see. Well, when he came here, he asked his usual question, are there any ruins around here? And they said, uh, yeah, sure, there are ruins here. Uh, there's, there's plenty up on the hill. So up on the hill he went. What Texier saw here really made him gasp. There was this King's Gate, as it is called. It was partially buried in his day, of course. But in the front of it here, there is a figure that they thought was the king. Really looks like a prize fighter, you know, doesn't he? Actually, one of the Hittite gods. This is not the original. The original is in the museum. This one is simply a plaster cast, and it's rather badly worn. When I first came here, it was in very good condition. And then Texier went up on the wall, and what he saw there made him even more amazed. When Texier got up here, he could look along the wall and trace it going right up the hill there. You can see it at the top of the hill, partially reconstructed up there. And following it round, he found that altogether it was about five kilometres in circumference. Well, this certainly wasn't Tavium. It was far too big for that. But what was it? The locals couldn't tell him, and he didn't have a clue. So what was this place? The following year, 1835, a British explorer by the name of William Hamilton came on the scene, and he stumbled across a place called Alacha Huyuk. This is the entrance to Alacha Huyuk, and these sphinxes on the side here are very well carved, and these were obvious to William Hamilton when he first came here. There's one each side of this gateway. He couldn't identify them, he didn't know who was responsible for them, and he simply recorded them. Then in the year 1862, George Perrow came across this place. It's called the Nishan Tash. And here were some strange hieroglyphic characters, which again were similar to the ones on the Haymat stones. And of course, he couldn't identify who was responsible for these uh, hieroglyphs, but uh, he recorded them. And then in the year 1870, Two American explorers by the name of Johnson and Jessup also visited Haymat and recorded their visit and noted the Haymat stones with the hieroglyphics on them. But then in the year 1872, a man of a totally different character came on the scene. And he was William Wright, who was an Irish missionary in Haymat. Now, he spoke the language he understood the Arabs and the Turks, and he saw these stones and recognized their value. And what was more important, he was on very friendly terms with the Turkish governor, Subi Pasha. And so he went to the governor and said, look, uh, it would be in the interest of the Turkish government to have these stones removed and uh, sent off to the museum. And so Subi Pasha, being a, an enlightened man, agreed to that. And so next day he sent his soldiers along to start chiseling the stones out of the wall. <laughs> and that is where the trouble started, because the locals regarded these not only as important stones in the building itself, and they didn't want the building uh, spoiled, but they also had a superstition that these stones had magical qualities, especially for eye diseases, of which there was no shortage at that time. And so they violently objected. However, the army was on the governor's side and they took the stones, took them back to the palace. Well, that night, whirling dervishes raced through the streets, stirring up the passions of the crowd. And uh, they tried to storm the gates of the governor's palace. And uh, William Wright, who was also there, was a little frightened inside. But the soldiers held out. Next morning, the governor received a delegation. And the delegation came in and stated their case. Now, what had made matters worse was during the night, there had been a fall of meteorites. And these falling stars had really uh, aroused the superstitions of the people. And so the delegation came in and the governor listened to them. And uh, finally, after their protests, he said, uh, now let me see, uh, did these falling stars do any, kill anyone? And they said, no. 
And he said, uh, did they kill any cattle or sheep? No. And he said, uh, did they damage any buildings? No. Ah, said the governor. Then what better av evidence do we have of Allah's good pleasure on what we have done? And with that choice bit of Eastern logic, the whole delegation came to an end. And the Hamath st stones were removed to the Constantinople Museum where they are today. In 1876, excavations were conducted at Karkemish. Now that's a way down, a long way from here in northern Syria. And in these excavations, these strange artifacts belonging to the same people started turning up. It was quite apparent that whoever it was had an empire extending right down as far as northern Syria. And during the next few years, artifacts were turning up all over Turkey. And the scholars were embarrassed because the public were asking them, Listen, you fellows, this was a great empire, and you don't know who it was. Then, in 1880, the archaeological bombshell burst. Archibald Henry Sace announced to an august gathering of scholars in London his conclusion that all these artefacts, all these evidences, should be attributed to none other than the biblical Hittites. Well, the scholars went off into peals of laughter. They said, Sace, you're mad. They dubbed him the inventor of the Hittites. But the facts were accumulating. And in 1881, the Encyclopaedia Britannica once more came out. This time, not eight and a half lines, but two whole pages. And down at the bottom of the article, there was this statement. We wait longingly for a confirmation of Professor Sace's view that the Hittites were the authors of the Hamathite hieroglyphics. If this be proved, this wonderful nation steps into a position hardly surpassed by that of any of the nations of the distant East. Well, it was a prophetic statement that really came true. And during the next few years, more and more information came in. And in 1884, our friend William Wright published a book called the Empire of the Hittites, in which he produced so much information and evidence that the scholars just had to back down and admit that Sace was right and that these people were the biblical Hittites. Then in 1887, there was a very interesting development. In that year, what are known as the Tel El Amarna letters were discovered, not here in Turkey, but away over there in Egypt. They were letters in the cuneiform script. At first, of course, the scholars said that they were forgeries because nobody expected cuneiform to be found in Egypt. But when they were read and understood, here were some letters that were found in the Assyrian cuneiform script, but in, the, in an unknown language, which scholars rightly concluded was the Hittite language. They were known as the Azawa letters. And scholars went to work on trying to decipher the Hittite language. There was a scholar in 1902 by the name of Nudson who concluded and announced that the Hittite language was actually an Indo-European language. <laughs> that also made the scholars laugh. Indo-European, why, it might be some other, it might be a Semitic language, or it might be Hamitic, but not Indo-European. And they produced so many arguments that poor Nudson recanted and admitted that he had made a mistake. Time was to prove that Nudson was correct. In the year 1906, a very eccentric German came here who was totally unsuited to the harsh Middle East Turkish conditions. And uh, he was not really an archaeologist, he was an epigraphist. That means he was an expert in inscriptions. And he was looking for tablets. And so he came to this place, Boghaskali, known to the Hittites as Hattusis. And his interest was to find tablets. And so he came to this Acropolis, or high place, the citadel, and started searching. Well, would you believe it? He started digging here, and he found no less than 10,000 tablets. And most of them were in the cuneiform script, which he could read 
like you read your daily newspaper, and in the Assyrian language, which of course he's, was he, his language. He could be very familiar with it. And so he was able to learn a lot about the Hittites. Well, he, night by night, he was a very hard working man, and night by night, he'd, by the flickering light of his lamp, you know, he'd pick up a tablet and translate it, pick up a tablet. And one night, he picked up a tablet and he could hardly believe what he saw there. He found himself reading the Hittite version of the peace treaty between Ramesses the Great and Hattaselus, the very one that was on the wall at Karnak and other places. And so here was the Hittite version of it. And so he was able to learn a lot about the Hittite history by reading these translations. In 1915, a scholar by the name of Hrozny confirmed that the Hittite language was indeed an Indo-European language and from then on there was no turning back and in 1929 a manual of the Hittite language was published in other words the scholars could now not only read the Hittite history in Assyrian language but also in the Hittite language so two problems had been solved First of all, the identification of the Hittites. Secondly, to be able to read their language. But now there was the third problem, and that was to be able to read their strange hieroglyphic characters. Actually, our friend Archibald William Sace had made an attempt at this in 1880. He'd come across what was known as the Takendimos seal, and it was a bilingual, that is the same thing in two different languages or scripts and he thought by comparing them he'd get a clue to reading the hieroglyphics but it was not to be it was only a, it was only a seal didn't give him much information in 1934 Kurt Battelle found here no less than 100 bilinguals and the scholars thought now we've got it made all these bilinguals that is the same message in two different scripts one readable, the other the hieroglyphs will be able to do it. But they're only seals and they all said more or less the same thing and so once more they had the problem. And so uh, the scholars had to work on this to try and find out how to unlock the Hittite hieroglyphs. The final breakthrough came from rather an unexpected quarter. There was a scholar by the name of Helmut Bosser and he was attending a convention. At the same convention, there was a Turkish scholar. And the Turkish scholar said to him, say, why don't you come and teach at the Istanbul University for a while? And so Bosser said, well, why not? And so he finished up at the Istanbul University. Well, during the holiday period, Bosser decided to do some excavating and he took a team down to a place called Karatepe. And there they did a season of excavations found a lot of interesting things. On the last day, when everyone was packing up their tents and goods and chattels, Bosser just did a little wandering around on his own account, and he saw a stone protruding from the ground. He did a little scraping, and he was very excited to discover that it was a slab of stone on which there was a Phoenician inscription. And he thought, wouldn't it be fantastic if this was a bilingual? That is a stone that tells the same thing in two different languages. And so he excavated another stone over here. And sure enough, there were some markings on it, which he thought were Hittite hieroglyphics. He thought, we've got it. But do you know what he did? He just filled it all in, left it there, didn't say a word to anybody. Just went back, packed up. Next morning, they went back to the university. Well, I think Bosser was one of these people who had a sense of the dramatic. In the next season of excavations, they all came to uh, the site and they started out the next morning. And Bosser said, well, now, where shall we start excavating today? Uh, why don't we start over here? And so he put his men to work there. And sure enough, a few moments later, there were squeals of delight they found this stone with the Phoenician inscription on it. And Bosser said, hey, wouldn't it be great if this was a bilingual? Uh, look, dig over here. And so they dug over there, and sure enough, here was this stone with these markings on it. But as it came to the light of day, Bosser realized that what he thought had been Hittite hieroglyphs 
were nothing more than the cracks and weathering of time. Boss Hare's heart just sank right down to his boots. However, they continued with the excavations, and sure enough, they did find another stone, and it was a bilingual. It was in the Hittite hieroglyphs. And so, as a result of comparing these two stones together, they were able to unlock the meaning of the hieroglyphs. And so, in 1954, a manual of a dictionary of Hittite hieroglyphs was published, and this opened a vast world of knowledge about the Hittites to the scholars and about the Hittite history. In their heyday, the Hittites were a powerful, well-organized and cultured people. And they had some very fine buildings. Uh, over there in the distance, you can see their temple area. It had well-paved roads, and there was this huge area that was for the temple purposes. And then there is a very strange stone. It's a green stone, and it doesn't come from this area. It came from a total, totally different area. And that also was a rather uh, puzzle because nobody knew just where it came from, and nobody can figure out just what it was used for. They had these huge storage jars and they had a very smart way of doing their buildings. You'll notice these drilled holes here. Well, this is an earthquake prone area and so naturally uh, stone buildings would tumble down. So what they had was stone foundations and then they used a wooden superstructure with tenons into these holes so that if there was a bit of a rumble, the building would stay intact. But the end finally came it is usually considered to be in about 1200 BC when they were annihilated by the peoples of the sea. Uh, personally, my own opinion is that it was later than that, in fact, centuries later, because, for instance, we have the records of Shalmaneser III in which he records his wars against the Hittites. We have even Sennacherib in the 8th century BC who talks about fighting against the Hittites. So I think that their final end actually came at the hands of the Assyrians. However, it certainly came. And then they were lost and forgotten. And the critics even denied that they existed. They scoffed at the Bible record and said just another Bible blunder. But remember, the Bible retained a record of them. And today, of course, everyone knows the Hittites. You've got the Hittite Hotel, you've got the Hittite Restaurant, you've got the Hittite Antique Shop and the Hittite Taxi Company. It's a very well-known people today. But it was only the Bible that preserved a knowledge of them. Remember, in 1861, just eight and a half lines in the Encyclopedia Britannica. But the Bible retained the record. And let me tell you, the Bible is a fascinating book. And I can assure you, it is historically reliable. Well, I agree. The Bible's a great book, but I do suggest that you get a translation in modern English. I find it much easier to read. In our next program, we'll be taking you to the cradle of civilization, where history began. And David will be telling the exciting story of Henry Layard unearthing the winged bulls of Assyria and Henry Rawlinson scaling the Behistun rock to find the key to cuneiform writing. <laughs>